Daniel chapter 5. We've been in this series on Daniel 5 um, for a few weeks now. We have uh, been tracking the life of Daniel. Could you imagine uh, a young teenager taken from his home, taken from everything that he knew, taken from his culture, taken from a land that uh, trusted in God, to take him hundreds of miles away to a place where uh, he didn't know anybody, his family was left behind. You know he would be heartbroken, but yet thrust into a culture that did not was nothing like what he knew, that did not honor or recognize the God that he served, and yet he chose to believe God. He chose to believe the truths of God that he had been taught, and not only just to, to believe them, but to live them out in front of everyone that was there. He didn't realize it. You may not realize it, but God wants us to be ambassadors to those who don't know Him. He wants us to be missionaries. That means that we know God and we know His truth, and what He wants us to do is to speak His truth, to live His truth, to show forth His truth in a world that's a different culture, that doesn't recognize our God, that doesn't respect our God, and they need to see something that is real in us. They need to see that God matters to us, that He's good to us, that He's blessed us. Now, if you're one of those sourpuss Christians, and all you want to do is go around and you're mad because you didn't get things your way and somebody said something hurts your feelings, and, and all you do is act like the world, all they're going to see is the world. But in the midst of this culture that is not like heaven, in the midst of these people that are hurt and are broken and are, are longing because everyone that does not God does not know God has a longing for that which is good and right. And they, be, may, they may be trying to fill that, that void in their life with all these other things. But, but if you're the missionary, if you're the ambassador of Christ, in your neighborhood, in your family, in your surroundings, at the grocery store. Then, then when life happens and they see you and you're so much different, then they'll get to see God and great things will happen. But for many of us, what we want is we want to have all the good things of heaven now. We want everybody to be nice to us. We want everybody to like us. We want everybody to be kind to us and good to us. And, and, and we just want to live our life down here. And, and it's what happens with Christians? This is, this is a sad fact, but it is a fact. Our, our scope, our friends, our circle of influence gets smaller and smaller and smaller because the longer you're a Christian, the more you're going to hang out with Christians and not hang out with people in the world. But yet, we're not just to be friends to other Christians and helpers to them. We're to be ambassadors of the light of God to the world. That's our mission. Heaven's not here yet. The Spirit of heaven may live within you, but He wants us out there. And it may be true that the more you, the longer you're a Christian, the, the more you hang out with Christians and not with lost people. But listen, the more you're a Christian, you should be the more adapt, the more confident, the more, the more able to live in a culture that's anti-God and live in it well in such a way that they can see your good life, your good love, your good light of God and say, it should be an attraction to them. And they should say, that's what I need in my life. But Christians, many times, we just get kind of aggravated that we have, to, we have to put up with those people. Before Keep your finger in Daniel 5. You don't have to go over there, but I'm going to uh, flip over to the book of Habakkuk because I think it, uh, Habakkuk was a prophet during the time right before Daniel was written. And he was prophesying to Israel and to Judah before they were taken into captivity. But the Babylonians had come and they were taking the, the outside cities and they were moving their way towards Jerusalem. And Habakkuk, the prophet of God, is mad. And he's mad at God because what God is allowing to happen. I want you to hear 
what Habakkuk says. Verse 1, chapter 1. The burden. This is bothering Habakkuk. It's kind of like Jeremiah said there was a fire burning within him, right? The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. Verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity? Why do I have to see this? And cause me to see trouble. For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. And here is Habakkuk's conclusion. Therefore, the law is powerless. Now, hold on. You understand and you know that the, the law of God is God's word. And, and whenever you are with God's word, the spirit of the living God makes those words alive. In Genesis 1 and 2, when God created the world, the Bible says, and God said, and God took those words and with the power of God, he made them come alive and creation happened because of it. God always amends his word with the power of his nature. But here, Habakkuk, is looking at the world and the ugliness, and he said, the, the, the word of God, the, the, the law is powerless. It's, it's never powerless. You just don't see the effect of it. So Habakkuk's mad that God's not doing something. Look what it says in verse 4. Therefore the law is powerless. Justice never goes forth. The wicked surround the righteous, and perverse judgment Proceeds. Instead of getting righteousness that is of God, the truth of God, we're getting perverse judgment. Well, God has to hear this, but then God has a word back for Habakkuk. And he says, look, among the nations and watch. You're going to see something that's not just about you. But what you don't understand, there's something that's happening that's bigger than just your little circle. There's something that's happening among the nations. Look at the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told to you. If I told you ahead of time what was going to happen, you wouldn't believe me. For indeed, hear this, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. You see those Babylonians? You see all the things that they're doing, and you're right. They don't care. They don't regard your God. They don't regard me. They don't regard your truth. They don't regard the law. They could care less about all of those, those things. But understand, Habakkuk, you don't know it. What I'm doing is I'm bringing them to myself. I want to save them. When you look at this world, instead of being mad at the world, Instead of being angry that, that they have unrighteousness in their life. And by the way, lost people act like lost people. If, if sin is ugly, then sinners will be ugly. But instead of being mad at them, why don't we act like God does and just love them? He said, what you don't understand is I'm raising them up. So when we get back to Daniel... We'll see all the things that God was doing in Daniel's life. In chapter 1, when, when, when Daniel was taken there as a teenager, he made the decision that he was going to live the truth of God. And you remember when he changed his diet and all those other kind of things? And when he was finally brought before Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, these guys, they're 10 times better than everybody else. Say it with me. 10 times better. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Say it with me. 10 times better. As we live our life on this earth, wouldn't it be great if they would look at us and say, of all the ugliness that I see out there, these, this guy, this woman, these children, they're 10 times better than anybody else I've ever seen. Then when we get to chapter 2, when, when, when Nebuchadnezzar had that dream and he's scared because he had the image of that person and he brought in all of his wise people, but nobody could tell him his dream. Nobody could tell him the the what that dream was all about, but Daniel could. And you remember when you get to the end of it, oh, how he bragged on the God of Daniel. 
when you get to that Daniel chapter 3 and he built that, that image of gold, 90 foot tall, 9 foot wide, and everybody was supposed to bow before it, but those Hebrew children wouldn't bow before it because the Bible says you don't have other idols. You don't bow your knee to anything else. And they were threatened. You'll either, you'll either bow or you'll burn. And they said, you do what you want. Nebuchadnezzar got mad, kind of embarrassed, and threw him in the fiery furnace. And by the way, God met them there. And Nebuchadnezzar says, has your God been able to take care of you? They came walking out of that. They didn't bow and they didn't burn, right? They didn't even smell like the fire. They were totally saved from it. And Nebuchadnezzar made a declaration. Your God is the Holy One. Then when we get to chapter 4, and we see Nebuchadnezzar's testimony of when he got saved. Oh, he wasn't always the right person. No, no, no. He was lifted up in pride like you and I get lifted up in pride. And by the way, God had to get his attention, and God did get his attention. Made him walk around on his hands and feet and he acted like he was a cow eating grass because he lost his mind. But after seven years, Nebuchadnezzar looked up and saw God. And he prayed to God. And God answered his prayer. God raised him up. God saved him. And that's exactly right. When I get to heaven, me and Neb are going to talk. It's going to be a good day because God can save us I love that word, to the uttermost. Then when we get to chapter 5, it's been 23 years later after Nebuchadnezzar's death. He has died. He had a few sons that tried it out a little bit to take over his place, but they couldn't. And he had a daughter who married this guy, and they had a child, and he had actually become the leader of Babylon. And we find him when we get to uh, chapter number 5. Now, he didn't know God. It says in verse 1, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords. He didn't know God, didn't respect God, didn't follow God's ways. Matter of fact, you remember the second image, the image in uh, Daniel chapter 2, where when he saw it, Daniel said it was this great big person and the head was of gold. And he said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold, your, your kingdom. But he said there was another one that was uh, a breast and arms of silver, that, and he told me, he says, that's the Medes and the Persians. Well, in, in verse 1, while Belshazzar is having this feast inside, and by the way, the archaeologists have found that in Babylon, there were, there were rooms where over a thousand people could meet. And they're having this big party in there, but just outside the walls, the Medes and the Persians were out there. But he wasn't worried about that. He said, oh, they can't get in here. We have these great series of walls. The, the river Euphrates runs right through it. We've got all the, the water we could ever want. We, we have food for 20 years, and this city of Babylon, 20 square miles, we, we can grow whatever crops we want. They can't get to us. So what they, when they should have been worried about was what outside the walls, they were throwing a party inside the walls and drinking. Look what it says in verse 1. The king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords, drank wine in the presence of the thousands. And while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and the silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the kings and the lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. They didn't care. They had no regard for the holy God. They just made little, they said, hey, you remember those things? Let's just use those. We'll drink out of them. And we'll praise the God of gold and silver and iron and wood. We'll, we'll praise the gods of this world. Well, <laughs> God never likes it when people do that. You know, we all live with choices. We either choose to do right or we don't. Some people say, I, I'm just not going to make that choice. I'm not going to make that choice. Well, that in itself is a choice. If you don't choose to say yes, you're saying no. You're saying no. And we're going to live with those choices that we make. And Belshazzar had no regard for any of those things. So as they're there, there was a hand 
that came up on the wall, all they could see was a hand. And it's writing on a plaster wall. Would that get your attention? Oh, today you look at it and you say, well, Brian's got some special effects. But what happened when you found out that it wasn't my special effects? What if you looked at it and all you saw was a hand and he was riding on it? The Bible says that Belshazzar saw this and his face turned, he changed and, and his bones were rattling within him. If he wasn't as bow legged as I was, he'd, his knees would be knocking. And he's looking at it and he's scared to death. So he immediately calls all the wise people in and says, tell me what this is. And he brought them all in and they're looking at it and the whole crowd is worried, but, but they didn't know what it said. Then the queen mother came. Look what it says in verse 10. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. Now this is Belshazzar's mom. The queen spoke saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you. Hold on, he just saw a hand writing on the wall. He said, don't let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man. That's the question that God has for us today. Is there a man that God can trust? Is there a woman that's willing to be used? Is there someone that God can use to help? He says, there is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. That's what the world needs to see. The world needs to see us and see God in us. Not that you're smart enough, you're not. Not that you can do it, you can't. But if you know God and His Spirit lives within you, you've got access to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Is there someone? She said, yes, there is someone. And then in the days of your father, actually your grandfather, but light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, made him chief of the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. There is one. So they went and got Daniel, and they brought him in. And then Belshazzar speaks to him, and he says in verse 14, I have heard of you. He knew the stories. He knew the stories. I believe we need to teach the young people the stories. I believe that we need to teach our children and our grandchildren. I believe we need to bring them to church. Let them be in Sunday school. Let them be there with people and let them hear the stories. Let them hear the stories of Daniel. Let them know even before they're of the age of knowing that they have sinned. I want my granddaughter, by the way, who's downstairs in children's church. I want her to be so ready that when the Lord calls her by name, that she won't be lost but a few seconds and she'll give her heart and life to Christ. That's what granddad wants. Seems like the world wants their kids to have everything that society can give and have all that the school can give and have all that the stores can give and have all that the sports can give and have all that the arts can give, but they don't want what God can give. That's a scary thought, folks. Because they're not going to be judged by if they could hit a home run. They're going to be judged by if they know the Holy God. He said, I've heard of you. Look what he says in verse 16. I've heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a gold chain around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. You know what Daniel said? Keep your money. By this time, he was taken to Babylon when he was a teenager, but by this time, he's about 80 years old. And he's looking at it and said, I don't want your money. I don't want your change. No. When I was a, y'all know that I'm a smart aleck, right? You can say amen. amen. <laughs> right? I have a spirit of mischief about me. I can't help it. I was talking to this guy one day and, I said, you know, my dad is rich. My dad is so rich. Uh, it, it, I, I can't tell you how much he's got. He is so rich. I said, you know, and the thing about it is, he wants me to be blessed. He wants me to have. As a matter of fact, he wants more for me than I even want for myself. 
And they're like, wow, I didn't know that, Brian. Of course, I had to change the subject and move it. I said, yeah, my Heavenly Father, he is he's mighty good to me. And they're like, oh, preacher. I wasn't even a preacher at that time, by the way. You know, we should know and realize and trust in and believe and be confident and rely upon that our dad can take care of us. We don't need what this world offers. Either you want to be conformed to this world, listen, or you're going to be conformed to God. Either you can be getting ready to live with God in heaven, or you can just act like, look like, talk like, dress like this world. And oh my goodness, that's not much. You can be liked by this world, loved by this world, stepped on by this world, used and abused by this world. When you're the one who wants to be your dad has so much better plan for you. So, verse 23, he said, let, look at verse 22. Here's Daniel's words back to him. He says, but you, Belshazzar, his son, Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. There's a choice. You could have followed in the way of Nebuchadnezzar. He changed his life. You could have. You didn't want to. You didn't seem to care. Maybe you thought one day, how pompous Why would we think that God owes us tomorrow? That we think, oh, I've got tomorrow. You better take care of today. You may not have tomorrow. Well, he says, you have not humbled your heart. They brought the vessels of the house before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. You have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which you do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of his hand have sent from him and written what was written. And he gives the interpretation of it. Verse 25. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Perez, really, is what he is saying. Verse 26. He defines it for him. This is the interpretation of each words. Mene. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel. You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. You have choices to make. Please hear me when I say this. The choices you make now will be your destiny. You have been weighed in the balance. You've been found wanting. He's looked at your life. You have no answer for your sin. God has numbered your days. By the way, tonight's the night. Everything that you have has been taken from you. It will be given to another. We make choices. And verse 30 says, That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. See, what Belshazzar didn't know was the Medes and the Persians had a plan. And for them to get through those walls, they decided what they would do is start diverting the water of the Euphrates around. 
So that wall that covered that river, by the way, a large, wide river, that wall that covered the river, the water would come up to it, but when they diverted the water and the came down, then they could move through on the sides. And the whole army came in. Babel, they know the exact date. History tells us the exact date that they came in and took over and Belshazzar was killed that night. And you have an opportunity while you're breathing. But once you breathe your last, your destiny set. It's gone. Let me read you a couple verses and I'll be through. In the book of Job, chapter 20, please just, I don't have it up on the screen. I just want your attention for the next few moments. Listen to these words. Don't you realize from the beginning of time, since man was placed on earth, that the joy of the wicked has been brief. The happiness of the godless has lasted only a moment. Though his arrogance reaches heaven, his head touches the clouds, he will perish forever like his own waste. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? The joys of the wicked has been brief. The happiness of the godless has lasted only a moment. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for man once to die. And after that, the judgment. Every one of us are going to die. God tarries. Every one of us are going to die. And you'll either, when you breathe your last, you'll either have the glory of the Lord welcoming you into his heaven, or you'll hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. It's your choice. Inside every one of us is the, is the dream of good. But there's only one way to heaven, and his name is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says this, For he says, In the acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. How can we be so arrogant to think that God will give us another day? When I was a young boy, I wish I could tell you how long, but God began to work in my heart. God began to show me my sin. God began by the power of his spirit, began to woo me to himself. And I can't tell you why I did this. I wish the first time that he called me, the first time that I felt that burden of sin and the first time I knew that I needed to repent and be saved, I wished I had said yes the first time, but I didn't. I began to run from it. I began to put it off. I, I began to play games. I remember my dad was a preacher and he'd stand in front of the church and the anointing of God would be there. And I'd say, uh, if he raises his right hand, I'll, I'll walk the aisle, get saved. And every now and again, dad raises his right hand. I'd say, oh, uh, uh, I, I mean, if he raises his left hand, dad would raise his left hand. I'm like, if they sing, only trust him. And then they'd sing that, and I would go, oh. And I began to learn that good old Baptist only sing the first and the second verse, and they quit. And I say, I, I knew if, if there's that time frame, if I could just hold on, I could get out the door and I'd be okay. Then every now and again, that dirty scoundrel, the choir director, sing three verses. And the piano player just play on and on, and I was in agony back there. No, I was doing the Baptist dance. I wanted to go, but I didn't. I wanted to go, but I didn't. I wanted to go, but I didn't. And you have to remember, this was the early 70s, and we all had a, some strange dances back then. 
But I remember the day I felt like my chest was going to explode. And I knew that I had to go. Now, I could have gotten saved in the pew. But there was something that God was going to say, are you going to put actions with your, with, are you going to put feet to your prayers? And I took one step out. Eli, I was about where you are. I was on the second pew. I took one step out. I think I floated the rest of the way down to the altar. And I gave my heart and life to Christ. And because of the love of God, Jesus took his pen and wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. And I've been held in his precious hand ever since. And he still holds my breath. And one day, he's going to say, go bring Brian home. And you know what? He won't have to call me twice that day. I'm going home to be with him forevermore. And when I get there and I see the glory and I see the love, the things that I've been longing for in my heart all my days, I'm going to look back and I'm going to say that's the wisest decision I ever made. But I wonder how many people are like Belshazzar. They've never humbled themselves. They've never repented. You can, you can repent and you can believe or you can have remorse and regret. The problem is regret may last throughout all of eternity. Today, if you hear the voice of God call to anyone who's in this room, to anyone who's watching online, please hear me when I say, if God is speaking to you today, only trust Him. Give your heart and life to Him. It's the greatest decision that can ever be made.